This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. I apologize that it's taken me so long to record this next episode, but a lot has happened since the last time I sat at this microphone. If you remember the last time I said that I was jet-lagged after traveling from the United States to Russia, well, that was in Russia, but now I find myself in Romania after a little less than two weeks in Estonia. And I'll explain how I got to this point. But before I get into that story, I I guess I want to say that I've tried hard to make this podcast uh, what is called evergreen, meaning that um, I've tried to avoid references to any particular dates, contemporary dates or events that are happening at the moment Rarely do I refer to those so that later on down the road and anybody that's listening, say five years from now, that there wouldn't be anything that would be anachronistic or throw people off when they listen to it. And I really like this podcast to speak to people for years to come, if at all possible, if it survives that long. But today I'm going to do a little diary entry. I didn't know what else to call it. It's going to be personal quite personal, and it'll also hopefully encourage you to hear how the Lord has been leading me and my family and the way that he has spoken to us through godly counsel and through the word and through our prayers. Soon after I arrived in Russia and after I recorded that last podcast episode, fighting broke out between Russia and Ukraine, and that released a lot of different things in the culture and in the world. And many people who are listening right now, as I record this, will know that uh, many services from the West have been cut off in Russia. The ruble has lost a lot of its value. Economic sanctions are kicking in. Uh, Just to give some examples of where things stand right now, uh, Facebook has been turned off within the Russian Federation. And Instagram... Visa and MasterCard have stopped serving Russia, which means that if I wanted to pull money out of my American bank account, I could no longer do it in Russia, go to an ATM machine and pull out money because Visa and MasterCard don't work anymore. Or if I wanted to use my American credit card to make a purchase in Russia, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, McDonald's, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Many large Western corporations have pulled out of Russia. IKEA suspended operations. I don't know if they've ceased operations. Um, There has been talk of the borders possibly closing in Russia. It's just a very hard time right now. Very, very hard time for people within the Russian borders. And obviously for people in Ukraine. There have been uh, millions of refugees. I may talk about that in a little bit. Uh, within the borders of Ukraine, I think seven or eight million people have been displaced. And as of today, about three million have actually crossed the border into neighboring countries, uh, mostly Romania, Moldova, Poland. And then from there, they fan out into other parts of Europe. And we found ourselves under, I would say, just intense pressure. I'll talk about it a little bit later. The State Department of the United States sent out multiple notices to American citizens to leave immediately. And uh, that was rare, very rare for the State Department. As a matter of fact, I've never seen it happen. They had given us some advice not to travel. (laughs) We'd often say, don't go to Russia. But now they were saying everybody has to leave. And to my knowledge, probably 95, 98% of the Americans that I know have left Russia have stepped outside and have left behind whatever life they had in Russia. A few have stayed, some for legal reasons, and uh, some have chosen to stay there. We were unsure and praying a lot about where the Lord would have us. 
And I remember early on in this process, I was praying, Lord, where do you want me? And his answer came back, I want you with me. And I thought that was a, <laughs> a really good answer. Where do you, I'm thinking, where does God want me physically? And he's telling me where he wants me spiritually. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too, how we look at things that are unseen instead of things that are seen. And then a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was three weeks ago, I'm losing track of time. We were at church and started really, really praying. And then I wrote um, an update about this. I thought what I might do is just read some of the updates that I wrote. These are things that I wrote down in the moment. And then I'll communicate a little bit more things that I wrote, things that people wrote back to me. In the lead up to that Sunday service, I had been writing to friends, trusted friends who I trust to discern spiritually, asking them what is their sense. Would the Lord want us to step out of Russia for a while or want us to stay? And so I got counsel, and all of that counsel was they sensed the Lord was saying, now is the time to, to leave for a little bit. Now I will say that I haven't left forever. Olga and I don't believe that our time in Russia is done, though we really don't see when we would return to Russia. We don't know what that would look like. Uh, it could be sooner, it could be later, it could be years. We don't know. Uh, I've often said that the Lord has called me very clearly to Russia 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, and I would have to have as equally clear of a call to leave. And I haven't received that. A friend of ours asked if I had made it to America yet. She sent a text message. And I said, no, we're in Europe. We're planning to come back into Russia. So uh, still, it was a big decision, a hard decision. So here's what I wrote maybe just a few days after that Sunday service, by the time we'd gotten into Estonia. So here's what I wrote. Over the past several days, many people have offered up prayers for us, and quite a few have written words of encouragement and comfort. Thank you. Ah, so this was actually written on the Monday, after Sunday. Yesterday at church, we were impressed that the Lord wanted us to leave Russia. Several things led us to believe that we should leave as soon as possible once the decision was made. We arrived in Estonia a few hours ago and are in a small apartment in the town of Yuchvi. The border crossing went smoothly. For all of this, we are very thankful. God has given us grace. Still, we have very heavy hearts. We are not celebrating being in Estonia. Mixed with the relief is a deep grief. We said goodbye to Olga's mother and grandmother, not knowing when or if we'll see them again. We left our home of 20 years not knowing if we'll see it again. I have a deep hope and expectation that we will see them sooner than we may think possible. There may be a great shift in circumstances in Russia and Ukraine, and let's continue to pray and to serve those who are suffering. And we will serve. Ukrainian refugees continue to arrive in the area. Valerie will help deliver some aid to families soon. And I will continue to serve our partners in Europe, and I have several other irons in the fire. Olga and Val will continue to homeschool. At the end of next week, if all goes as we hope, I will teach at a ministry training school in Romania. If the borders remain open, then we will, by God's grace, return to Russia. For now, we are given a great chance to live one day at a time. And please pray for Olga. This is particularly hard for her. So that's what I wrote just after we had walked across the border from Russia into Estonia. We left our home with two large suitcases and some carry-ons and a couple of backpacks. Most of that was homeschool books. So we came with some clothing. We didn't bring any of our cherished photographs. <laughs> we brought our computers and some clothes and homeschooling books. A friend of ours drove us to the border, and then we had to walk across, and another friend picked us up on the other side in Estonia. Uh, not to make too big a deal of it, but we do have a sense of what refugees feel. 
We packed up quickly within a day's time, left quickly, prayed a lot, and now are unsure if we'll see our home again. In my spirit, I believe I will. I don't think God is done with us in Russia, and yet we don't know. We really don't know. Since we've left, things have gotten a little bit worse for Westerners in Russia, but the way things have been changing, they can certainly change again pretty quickly. I guess I'll underscore a couple of things here. I say in the, when I wrote this that um, we had a sense that we should leave as soon as possible. I felt a very intense pressure, and it wasn't fear, because I know what fear is, and I've dealt with fear, fighting spirits of fear quite a bit in Russia over the years, but this was an intense, intense spiritual pressure. And I really don't know any other way to say it. It was just a heavy, heavy, heavy burden. And a few scriptures came to mind when Paul, well, when he was named Saul, called Saul, when the Lord spoke to him, he said, "Um, it's difficult for you to kick against the goads. And for those who don't know what a goad is, a shepherd would carry a staff. I believe this is the way it works. One end has a hook, and the other end of the staff has a point. And that point is called the goad. And the shepherd can be ahead of the sheep and hook them with the staff with the hook and pull them where they need to go. Or the shepherd can walk behind the sheep and poke them in the rear end with that sharp point of the goad to get them to move in the direction he wants them to go. And as I was feeling this intense pressure, trying to discern the will of God, that scripture came to mind. Don't kick against the goads. Don't kick against this work of God to poke me, (laughs) push me, and move me in the direction that he wanted me to go in, because I did not want to leave Russia. And, uh, heartbroken that we're not there right now. So that was one thing that was behind what I wrote here, is that uh, God had said, don't kick against the goads. And I'll apologize. I don't know if you can hear it, but um, there's some dogs barking outside. I'm in a home now in Romania, and uh, there's roosters. I don't think there are any roosters at the moment, but dogs barking, maybe people coming and going behind me. We are blessed, super blessed, because God has given us a tremendous number of relationships in many different countries. And when we went to Estonia, uh, some of you will know this because you know of our ministry in Estonia, we settled in this little town of Yukvi, and there is an apartment that we use when we are in Estonia. It belongs to a British couple They don't use it anymore, and they just let us use that apartment whenever we want to. It's one bedroom, a living room, a little tiny kitchen, bathroom. It's small, but good, you know, nice, kind of run down a little bit because nobody really lives there. But we were able to settle in that apartment. And I have a car in Estonia, so we were able to pick up our car. And then I'm on the board of a Center for Children with Disabilities in Yukvi, And we're very connected with the summer camp that is also in that area. So we know believers there, have friends there. We were able to go have fellowship. We were in familiar surroundings. So as far as being refugees, it's probably one of the best circumstances you could hope for. We could very quickly be with friends and settle in to our own place and know that we had a place for as long as we wanted to stay there. Another thing that influenced our decision, and this is how we discern spiritually, is, um, well, a friend of ours had a prophetic word in America. I'll say her name, Amy. You had a word for us and shared it with us. And the basic idea of that prophetic word was that I, Mike, should not travel alone. I shouldn't go anywhere without my family. And we uh, months ago, we had planned that I would teach at a ministry training school in Romania, and I was planning to be in Romania at this time. It's been on the calendar for a long time, and so I was planning to go, but then we sensed this word from the Lord, a prophetic word, that we should stay together as a family, 
And so we went to Estonia as a family. And actually we went, I guess, just a few days earlier than we would have otherwise and settled over there. Again, we're really trying to pers- again, we're really trying to discern the will of God and be obedient to his will. And then we've come here as a family. We drove down, it's two long days through Europe, no problems driving through Europe and arrived here in Romania. We're staying with a friend, David and Rodiga is the couple. Their daughter Sabrina is a good friend of Valerie's. So we're also in a nice place here. Through all of that, we've had this really deep grief. And a good friend of mine, Mike, he and I are involved with the ministry down in Congo and Uganda. I've probably mentioned him before. Uh, Mike officiated at our wedding in Russia, and then he planted the church down in Congo. And through him, I've been serving churches down there. And it is interesting how God's been teaching me how to help people that are traumatized by circumstances. (laughs) And now I'm traumatized by circumstances. So God's been preparing me and my family for this very thing. So I wrote to Mike. He asked how I'm doing. I wrote back, told him, you know, that we're struggling with some things. And part of Mike's story is he had to flee from Congo when war broke out. And the armies were coming up from the south towards the city that he was living in. And all of the Congolese believers were telling him, you need to leave. You've got to go because the soldiers are going to be here soon. And it is not safe for white people to be here right now. So they had to leave on very short notice and leave the work that they had planted. They had lived there for years. So I want to read what he wrote to me, which was really helpful. And of course, uh, yeah, it just comes from his experience. And it also puts into words kind of what we're processing through right now. He said, Hi, Mike, I feel for you and Olga and Valerie. It must be hard. While I have not left behind as much as you guys did, I certainly know the feelings associated with fleeing your home and your loved ones. So I thought I would share something that helped me. The heaviness that I felt was something I had never experienced before. It took a bit of time for me to discern what it actually was. It was a mixture of several emotions that would fall on me, sometimes individually and sometimes in rapid dissension of one after another. I felt gratitude at one moment, followed by guilt, a longing to be with our church, followed by shame, moments of hope, followed by doubts, and then worry and sadness as I thought about those who could not leave, and then loneliness, and then second-guessing my decision. It took me quite a while to figure out how to deal with this, but I ended up having to address every one of those feelings, even the good ones, like being grateful that my family was safe while others were not. And I dealt with these emotions individually rather than dealing with a simple heaviness. I actively and methodically applied God's word and perspective to each separate emotion until I had mastery over it. For me, shame was the worst, and I hope that none of you are feeling that. He continues, I don't know if this is of any help, It was my journey and how I walked through it. I will add how anybody could experience something like this without Christ is beyond me. And now you get to help walk through their loss and pain in this pointless war with a bit more understanding than you had even a few days ago. And then he quotes Psalm 84, Passing through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs. Yes, the early rain covereth it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Amen. So that was a really good, encouraging word. And it's interesting that he also used this word heaviness, which I would call that pressure, that big heavy burden. And now that we're here, in some ways it lifted, but in other ways it doesn't. Um, And there's still a burden there, very much a burden. So along those themes, here's something else that I wrote. I think I wrote this in an email to a friend. I can't remember. I just copied and pasted into this document that I'm reading now. Here's what I wrote. It's hard to describe the breadth of emotions and thoughts that occur at times like this. We are being given an excellent opportunity to learn how to walk through things like this as followers of Jesus. 
The temptation is to say, once we get through this hard time, then we can live our spiritual life again. But that is not the way the Lord leads us. Sometimes we go through hard things, and he promises to give peace that passes understanding, and he promises to be a good shepherd. He wants us to be spiritual people, wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, looking at what is unseen rather than what is seen, counting the cost and living fearlessly. And the really good news is that he promises to give us all that is needed for the things that he allows into our lives, if we'll seek him and abide in him. For those who don't know him, uh, this was a Facebook post, I think. And then in parentheses, I say, I imagine some reading this are not followers of Jesus. The first step is to have a new mind, to understand that God's ways are not our ways, to turn from our ways and face him, then to put our lives into his hands, to believe in him. That is faith, and that is how God wants people to live, by faith. As I said, it's a sweet time to learn eternal truths while counting the cost of what may yet come. We really are given an excellent opportunity to learn how to go through this well. I certainly don't want to pretend I don't have the emotions and the feelings and the burdens and the weights and the sorrows and the griefs that I have. And yet, we're not overcome. And I think that's a good time right now for me to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So starting in verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. As it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. And with that same spirit of faith, we also believe, and we also therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. That scripture has been so helpful to me. And I get it more. I understand it better. Man, it's just so true that anything good that may flow from my life is only the work of God in me because I am a jar of clay. My goodness. And what Paul says here, hard pressed on every side but not crushed. I, boy, I felt that. Surely I haven't felt it as much as he did, but hard pressed all the way around but not crushed, not in despair. Struck down, but not destroyed. Amen. There's so much hope. And my prayer is that whatever happens to me and my family will ultimately bring people to give thanksgiving and glory to God. We'll go through these things well as Christians and we'll finish this race. I'd also like to share something that was written by um, an elder at a church in Texas. His name is Joel. He sent a really encouraging letter. 
and uh, I just want to share it with you. Uh, he wrote, Thank you for letting us know your situation. We will be praying for God's guidance and covering for you all. What a wonderful God who brings life and fruitfulness out of even human evil and calamity as he is doing for you all and through you all. Please give our love to Olga. All we can ever do for those we love is follow God's will, no matter how painful it may be. As we trust God that we are doing his will, we can trust that he is working through what we have done, no matter how painful the separation, to work in the hearts of those that we love. We'll be praying especially for Olga's mother and grandmother, that God's covering and will for them and for you will continue to unfold as he leads each of us to the completion of our journey home, where the circle will forever be unbroken. Thank God that this world is not our home. Amen. That's just so encouraging. The best that we can do for our family members is to do the will of God, no matter how painful it is. And as we're obedient to what the Lord is leading us in, we trust that he is continuing to be faithful with everyone else. And that his covering and his will for them will continue to unfold. And then he's going to lead each of us to complete our journey home. And thank God this is not our home. It's particularly difficult to completely surrender as a sacrifice uh, the home that we've lived in for 20 years. I went through that process a few years ago where I really let it all go. Uh, Olga didn't have to go through that until recently. And it's, um, yeah, it's a big thing to actually surrender our sense that this is our home, our place, what we've built over the last 20 years to really let it go and think we may never see it again. I know that some of my listeners are involved in ministry to refugees, and this feeling, this event to work through of leaving home and saying, I may never see it again, and some people will say, I probably will never see it again. This is familiar to you. You've heard people talk about it. I was a little too flippant about it before, but now that I've walked through some of it, I have a lot more compassion for people that are in that spot. Uh, There are a few other things that people shared. Uh, There was a quote from Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, that came up. And it's one of those things that just touched me at that time. And I think it may be from, I don't know, The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings from the book. And this is the quote. The world is indeed full of peril, and in it are many dark places. But still there is much that is fair. And though in all lands... Love is now mingled with grief. It grows, perhaps, the greater. (laughs) I really like that. Yeah, love mingled with grief, and yet love grows greater. That's what I'm finding. Uh, There is love mingled with grief, and uh, our love is growing greater. Amen. Another thing that I wrote uh, is... People's hearts will be softened because of the shock, shame, and hardship. We are praying about how the Lord wants us to act and react. Life inside of Russia will get harder. And this is an excellent opportunity to learn how to go through this kind of situation well as Christians so that we can help others. Um, a friend also sent some scriptures. This was nice. First John 4.4 4. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And then he also included, I will instruct you and show you the way to go. And with my eye on you, I will give you counsel from Psalm 32. That was just nice. Somebody over in America praying and has a scripture and sends it over to us. Uh, I exchanged a few text messages with a Russian friend who is, I won't mention his name, he's moving out. I think his flight is scheduled for Wednesday. Hopefully everything's going to go well. He and his wife and two teenage daughters are going to leave everything and resettle somewhere else. Uh, I wrote to him, we are going through, like you, a very wide range of emotions. The Lord is telling us to live one day at a time. And we remember something that Elizabeth Elliot always said, 
when faced with very difficult situations, do the next thing. And I guess I'll underscore that. I've been working with the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation for quite a while, and (laughs) yeah, she said do the next thing, and now we're in a spot where we're really putting that into practice. We just do what comes next. And we don't worry about too far down the road, just do the next thing. Well, my friend replied, after I said do the next thing, he said, yes, that's what we do. We don't plan ahead. We just live one day at a time. The next step we don't know. We'll see how God leads. Trusting his leading. Feels like in the dark you reach forward to see if he is there. And when you touch him, peace fills your heart and you keep going, carefully putting your feet down because it's hard to see. But he sees the way. He is leading. Yeah, man, that's just so good. This image of reaching out in the dark and then touching God and then peace filling your heart and then you keep moving. That's what my friend and his family have been going through. Those are really good eternal truths and they can only be learned in times of trouble and trial. And honestly, the world needs people who understand this what it is to be a disciple and trust only in him. And that's why we need to be really good students at times like this to listen to what the Spirit is saying and be obedient to what he says. A good friend of mine in the States, David, I spoke with him too. He told me some of the troubles that he's been through and he shared something with me that he had learned. And it very much relates to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians David said that he had learned to look past the facts to the truth. Meaning there are circumstances that are there, facts, things that are really truly happening in life, but to look past those facts and look over to the truth. I relate that to what Paul says about setting our eyes on what is unseen as opposed to what is seen. And I took a few notes as he was talking What are some of the things that we can look to in the truth that are perhaps obscured by facts if we focus on the facts? One of the truths that he said is, I'm not in control, but God is. Another truth is that God is not limited in power or in love. The facts can overwhelm, but the truth is God isn't limited in his power or his love. Another fact is, In the final chapter, we'll all be together in heaven. God's people will be together. I spoke at a Romanian church yesterday and said, I think what I've said here on the podcast quite a bit, the best is always ahead for followers of Jesus. And I got quite a few amens, especially from the older believers. And that's the truth. We can look past the facts of our current suffering and difficulty and say, yeah, amen, the best really is ahead. And in times like this, we can learn really, really good spiritual truths. I believe it's Peter that says anyone who has suffered in the flesh is done with sin. I should have looked that up before I said it, but it's true. Boy, as we go through these hard things, there's just so much stuff worthless stuff that falls away it just doesn't it doesn't apply anymore all this worldliness self-concern we want to keep our eyes on the lord one thing that i'm really really happy about is that our faith in the lord and our trust in him has not been shaken at all nor bitterness nor accusation nor grumbling none of that has happened in our lives Uh, and that's wonderful that is really really wonderful You know, the nation of Israel, they were led out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the desert, heading towards the promised land, and they had seen great miracles, and God had rescued them, and he was providing for them, but he wasn't giving them exactly what they wanted, and they started grumbling. And he said, you know what? You keep grumbling, and you're not going to enter into my rest. You are not going to enter into the promised land. Because you're grumbling and complaining about how I've provided for you. God help us to be people who don't grumble or complain about the hard situations that you give us. Because God, we know 
that you are leading us to the promised land. You are leading us, amen, to those still waters, that green pasture. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to fear any evil because you're with us. Amen. Your guidance comforts us. So Lord, help us all, myself, anyone listening to me right now, God, help us to surrender our lives and lay down our lives and be grateful and content in whatever circumstance you give us. Lord, your ways are not our ways. Your ways are so much higher than our ways. Amen, God. We thank you so much. Well, friends, I feel like I need to wrap it up now. Um, I'm not sure when I'll get back to another episode. To be quite honest, my mind is filled with all of the activities and things that are going on here. I will be speaking at that ministry training school this weekend. I've been invited to speak at Bible studies and at churches. And I guess one last thing I will say. I've mentioned it before. You could go back and look up the episode. I think it was called Aquila, Priscilla, and Carl. But the story of Aquila and Priscilla, if you track them through the book of Acts and in the epistles, they were a Christian couple, Jews, who were kicked out of Rome because they were Jewish. They end up in Corinth, where they meet Paul. They go to Ephesus, and there they meet Apollos and encourage Apollos. And then in the book of Romans, Paul writes and says, Greet Aquila and Priscilla and the church that meets in their home. So they're in Rome again, having a home church. And then I believe it's in, I think it may be 1 Timothy, maybe 2 Timothy. Paul says to Timothy, who is in Ephesus at the time, says, greet Aquila and Priscilla. And so there they are in Ephesus again. And at one point, Paul says, they served all of the churches in Asia. This is when they were in Ephesus the first time. And everybody there remembered them really serving all the congregations in the region. And for years, I've thought about them as a really good example of people who were moved around by political activities and treated harshly because of who they are, but they're always doing God's work. And when we see them, they're faithful and they're serving. And so now Olga and Valerie and I, uh, we're in a spot like that. And actually for that reason, I feel like we will end up back in Russia again at some point. Could be years, could be months, could be days, could be decades. Though I don't have many decades left. But we want to be faithful wherever God puts us. Well, let me close with a prayer today. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is living and active. Father, I pray that today some of what I've said is actually your word to encourage people who are listening. God, help us to surrender our lives, to die to ourselves more and more and more so that your life will be shown through us. Amen, God. We are weak. We're jars of clay, but God, that surpassing power that you give us, it comes from you, it's not from us, and I pray, Lord, for all of us, amen, that that surpassing power, the resurrection power of God, your resurrection power will be evident through our lives, God, and that you would be glorified, not us, amen. said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.